Did you see um, everybody keeps posting about this Hertz selling all their Teslas? Yep. What's your take on that one? I As mean, a rental car guy. <laughs> logistically, it makes sense because mm -hmm. you can't, I, I don't care who you are, you can't charge these cars efficiently and fast so enough. So Hertz is selling, what, 20,000 Teslas or 40,000 Teslas, something like that? Uh, 20,000. 20,000 yeah. Teslas yeah. out of their fleet. For, for nothing, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, everybody's like, see, nobody wants electric cars. And I was kind of thinking, I was like, it just seems like, when somebody gets in a Tesla that's never been in one, you kind of have to explain to them yeah. a few things. I feel like they just don't want to deal with that. But the, yes, like, oh, no. you need to use this card and click this button but I and feel charge like it like this. And a lot of these people are probably just like, yeah. can't. You either can't. Or get they people break to, the charging port off or something yeah. stupid because they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. You either don't have employees to convince like how to do it, like that can teach how to do it. Yeah. Or you just don't want to deal with your. I mean, customers. it's not part of the rental process. And what are they gaining by putting all these electric cars in there? other than the fact that they can tell people they have an electric fleet or a partially electric fleet. Yeah. But when you charge, I mean, it, it's not easy to keep these things charged. And a lot of people will come back or they'll run out of battery or the car will say it's got 230 miles of range, but in, in real life driving, it's 170 miles. And now it's looking for a supercharger. Like you have to be about that life. I think I drive a Tesla every day now. My wife does too. And it's completely change the way I enjoy life with my daily drivers. I was a big proponent of that like thousand dollar crap Mercedes life yeah. or Audi life. And I did that for a while, but uh, because then you bang it up. But a Tesla is a perfect, like comfortable car that you could bang up. It's got, it just blends in with everything. Nobody notices you. And, and if you charge it at your house every day, I leave with a full tank. I haven't had to go get gas in, I don't know, over a year. So, and then I get this uh, BMW Mini Cooper that I got today from Enterprise, and you realize why the Teslas don't really work, because I got this car and the brakes were still squeaking from the, just hosing it down to go from one customer to me. Yeah. And there's a whole line of dripping wet cars, and they're like, which one do you want? And you can't do that with a Tesla, because it's got to be on a charger for, like a, a proper charger for at least three or four hours. Unless they have this supercharging network, which they don't have. They'd have to go to Tesla superchargers to do that, and that's that doesn't work. Yeah, there's not like a downtime. They're just trying to hand it off to the next customer. I get it for the daily driver. People always hate on the electric cars if you own a gas car. Yeah. But I get it for the daily driver. I've, I, well, that's the thing. I've got both, and I could be objective about it. And, like, do I will I have fun in the fastest Tesla ever made? No. Like— I need noise. I need engagement, and you you don't get that. Is it fast? Sure. So it's a linear induction roller coaster, but like that's all. Like it gets old as soon as you do that. If you use it for getting around and not having to gas up, and like I, I'm sure there's been a point in time where you looked at the pump and you're like, oh Jesus Christ, and 120 dollars to fill up at some point for something, and it just annoys you. It's like ah, like what, what did I even do? I did. I filled it up. Like six hours ago. Or and once you have like a plaid and you launch it like eight times, you show all your friends, you're like, all right. Yeah, and then, then it's over. That, that's just that's it. Yeah, that, that's the only trick I've got. Yeah, that's all it is. But for driving around, I all of my Teslas I ever buy for myself are like, I call them peasant spec. It's no options. I get the white one and the black interior with mm -hmm. no options. And it just, it works. It, well, you can't tell the difference. But they all the, look the same, the exactly. Data, the most expensive $200,000 Tesla. Is the same the, thing with a, a P90 <laughs> yeah. badge on the back or something. And the cheapest one, they almost look the same. Yeah. Maybe and they, you don't they have do, gold though. wing doors if but, it's... But which is what I like about them is that they just blend in. It's not like a, a flex to show up in like in a, in a new G-Wagon or something like that. Here's just a Tesla. Nobody's asking... If you show up, like, to a restaurant in a Ferrari, everyone's like, oh, sir, we'd uh, park this right out front. It's only $50. I'm like, I don't need you to park it out front. Like, and that, it's like you don't have to go through that sort of uh, thing. But I, I understand that there's a giant subculture of owners that, that they live for that. They're never going to drive the cars like we do. They just want that recognition that they have a Ferrari, and this is what it's capable of. Look at this dude's video. Watch what he did with my car. And they, that's how they get their rocks off is that everybody knows that that guy has a car that's capable of this, but that's also the guy who's going to crash leaving cars and coffee because he's going to step on the gas thinking he's going to do the thing that the guy on the internet did. And it required a little bit more skill than just like, all right, if I do this and that, what's going to happen? Do you think Hertz like scored a nice tax break when they got them and kept that? Like, you know, cause you get like whatever $7,000 tax credit on the electric cars. Do you think they 
Do you think they worked some sort of deal where it ended up looking pretty good for them to get rid of it? So I'm sure when, look, when you buy 10 cars, you probably have some bargaining power. When you buy 20,000 cars, you're not going to Tesla dealer. You're, you're speaking directly to like yeah. Tesla corporate like that's and saying- That's like a year of their factory. Yeah, and, and, and whatever factories, even if it's two months worth of production, yeah. like th that price, they, they didn't pay anything near- um, what the rest of us would have ended up paying. So and they're probably not losing their ass there too much on selling them. And then also you get that EV tax credit stuff that people talk uh, about. And, and that's quite, I mean, as far as I know, Tesla doesn't pay much in taxes at, at all anyway. Yeah. So like whatever the accountants are doing. But I think that in that realm, I, I don't think uh, Hertz was hurt by the purchase and the sale of these. Mm -hmm. But also, I think they said the um, uh, driving factor was the cost to repair them was higher than the other cars. So if now you've got the cost to repair being higher, that especially if they're selling insurance to somebody and you bang up their Toyota Camry, it costs them eight grand to fix. You bang up their Tesla, it costs them 30000 to fix. They're writing that check. They have underwritten by selling that guy that $30 a day policy their cost of repairing their fleet is going up because it's more expensive to, you can't go get a a, a used Camry fender and yeah. put it on a Tesla. You have to buy the parts from Tesla. Yeah, and I'm, I, Every body shop I've ever talked to hates Teslas. Yeah, no, I They end up that. sitting there for so long because they can't get the parts. Yeah. Because like a bumper, they're, they're giving them to new cars. They don't care about the car that really just got banged up. Sure. They're really concerned about the new stuff. Yeah, so I could see how that would... Probably not. Yeah, I mean, I, it's it's a really interesting. I, it's it's more than just what hits the articles as mm -hmm. far as the decision to just offload all of them. But I I think it was probably a logistical issue that they couldn't keep the utilization as high on the Teslas as they could on a regular car. That like it's topped off by the customer when they come in. You you can't ask your customer to top off your Tesla on the way in. Do you have any other faith in any of these other electric car companies? I, I don't follow any of them. Like, because uh, I know a lot of them pop up all the time. Yeah. because they're like, well, Tesla did it. We can. Yeah. Look at this. Rivian. Venture capital. Yeah. Well, please. exactly. There, there's one in China, Neo or something like that, which is is a hot mm -hmm. topic right Lucid now. Lucid is pretty big. Yeah, but I, I mean, I don't. I'm not familiar with any of them. I don't care. They all drive the same. They're all the same thing. To me, I'm not excited by any of them, so I don't pay attention. Like I, I'll know more about Gordon Murray's T50 than than I will yeah. about any any other car, uh, any electric car out there. People probably just love to talk about them because they're trying to get in on the bottom, imagining they're getting in like Tesla the stock the on the theoretically. Um, but also, I mean, look, I I think that if I were to look at the future, and I was very anti electric car when they came out because I didn't think they'd have range. There may come a time where we can have a swappable battery the size of this basket that'll mm -hmm. charge your car for 300 miles. And you can have three of them sitting in your trunk and you just pop one out, pop one in, and you're right back to the road. You put them in your charger at home, like your your typical drill or something, or your Ryobi drill where you can swap batteries. That could be the case. The gas stations could have a wall full of batteries and they just pull in, pull out, almost like a quick change of the pit stop. So if we get to that point, they're gonna people people will have a hard time arguing their functionality. I mean, they, they drive fine. They, they're they quiet. They do exactly what you need them to do. The technology inside the car is great. Heated seats, the thing's always warmed up. You, you never have to jumpstart it. Like, I mean, all of these positives. And then the cost of maintenance is significantly lower because you have no oil changes. You have no fluid changes. It's just, it's like maintaining a golf cart. And there's a big bandwagon push, of course, too, because like, you know, Ford is like, we need ours. And then Porsche has their Taycan. Yep. And Everybody's kind of trying to get on that same bandwagon, which I don't really agree with. I think a lot of those companies should stick with what they're yep. good at. I don't think Ford has any business yep. making an electric F-150 because they can. I, I mean, look, at the end of the day, they, they saw everyone pushing big electric. And I think the government was incentivizing big electric for everybody to transition over. Yeah. I think the, the government has since hit the brakes on that. I think there is a place in the world, and I think that a majority of the commuter cars should be electric, but fun cars should be entitled to be fun, like natural, like not not necessarily unrestricted, but there should be a lot less restriction on uh, recreational cars than there are uh, the the majority of the the stamping out the Kia Rios and everything that people are using to get to and from work. Yeah, because I mean those are pretty. 
user friendly, yep. basic as can be. Like yeah, my mother in law's just... car has like nothing inside of it. Like yeah. no but like every button's like black button, you know, yeah, they're like yeah. you can't actually touch them. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, there's nothing in here. Yeah. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> I'm I'm curious where I mean who knows where where it's going to go, but I think that we're going to see a lot more electrification. And theoretically, I think there's a road that just opened up in Sweden or something where the road is electrified, so the cars are in a perpetual state of charging while driving on them. And I'm sure some cities too will be pretty nice if, yep. like, you know, I, I don't love it, but like you know. Um, what is it, London, like there's like a tax for coming in with like a gas-powered vehicle, I guess. So, you know, if you have like a tight city and it's all electric, it's going to be nicer to walk around yeah. in. It's just inevitable. Well, they're doing that in New York too. They're doing a, a toll for a certain sector of the yeah. city. If you go in it during daytime hours, they charge you another $15. See, it's fine with me because I don't want to go to New York yeah. City anyways. And I can understand, like I've, you walk around New York City and you're like, <laughs> yeah, because of all the... The garbage, yeah. Well, yeah. no, it's, it's the not. The, you're, you're not. Just, you're not getting that. It's like just being in a city. It, being in a city, it's like being in Miami. You're not smelling the emissions and everything like that, and like the cruise ships, like yeah. giving all. So, it, it it's not quite that bad. But I do see a big shift if you've gone to cities like Copenhagen, uh, in Denmark. There's it's, cars are almost like there's more uh, bicycles than there are cars. Mm -hmm. And it's weird, like the people in business suits with their briefcase, like riding a bicycle. But that's just the way the culture is over there. That I would be big on is electric bicycles and scooters. And your stats. So that was about uh, yeah. about to get into. You're seeing a lot more of that because it makes sense. Yeah, a and, five thousand pound vehicle will never be environmentally friendly, and it's <laughs> going to cause more traffic. It's harder to maneuver. Yeah. But if if we're starting to switch over to these scooters and like micro mobility, that's that seems to be the the going trend that you could fit more people in less space. You don't need one guy in a seven-passenger Escalade ESV that takes up a lot of space. No, and that's right sense. now, that's what we have is a bunch of people one at a time in an, in an SUV. If you could take that same spot and put 30 people in it, mm -hmm. they're all moving at the same pace. You've now relinquished a lot of your headaches with uh, traffic. Like when you look at places like Thailand, like where there's like 5,000 yeah. scooters that all cross each other. Yep. I'm like, man, if those were if that zero works, emissions, yeah, yeah. that would be because those things are all burning oil and stuff. I, I mean, too. And, and that's the old argument, too, because I like I to to do the electric vehicles and everything is like I want to save the planet. Yes. We, we, we all have to save the planet collectively. Like we can't save the planet as California and New Jersey and New York. But. India's cranking and China's cranking out any emissions that they want unregulated. So, and they've got five times the population we do. So what are we doing? Like, why, why am I, or why are you telling me I can't uh, do this with my Corvette and it's going to be pushing out too much emissions, but your private jet that you're flying puts out more emissions starting up than my car does in its entire life. So like, you don't think about that. You see the cruise ship putting out like whatever enough carbon emissions to offset everything I could possibly do in my lifetime with 50 sports cars. And, and that thing's just idling at the dock. So there, there's a, there's a big argument to be like, wh what's actually controlling? Like, is the start stop on our cars really doing anything? Or is it just annoying the piss out oh, of us? Oh, that's the worst. I mean, yeah. my wife's car, I'm like, the starter's just going to fail. Eventually, like, but the starters are amazing now. Yeah. I'm like, like, I've never had a starter failure. Fail. Yeah. Like, yeah. I know they kind of use compression to start back yeah. up sometimes, like in fuel, like yeah. they kind of spark themselves back up. But still, I mean, something's going to fail doing that. And even uh, during COVID, they were flying planes that were empty yep. just because they had to like they keep move. things yeah. moving. They were just flying empty planes around, and well, I'm like, man, that can't be good. Also, a lot, uh, a lot of people don't realize that even passenger planes they move a lot of cargo. Yeah. So, like, the passenger plane is going from point A to point B, and there could be caskets on it. There could be mail on it. There could be packages. There could be. There's a whole bunch of stuff that and goes under the belly people. of the plane, and five people. And even when you have your full flight going from here to London, you could have. A, a bunch of commerce on it too. And and I've, I buy stuff from, there's a guy, M is for Max. He's an artist out of Miami and he ships that stuff like on planes. So he boards it up and packages it up and I pick it up at the airport. So it's like air freight. And so there's a lot of stuff that moves on planes that people don't think about. Uh, and it makes sense because why would a, a airplane not leave completely full? Why would they yeah. be like, all right, we've got half the cargo hold empty. They can make money doing that. That plane's flying no matter what. That's why those things get around so quickly. Yeah. Do you miss the rental car business at all? I'm still in it. I, I know. Yeah. You, yeah. You said you sold the one business. In we sold the one. Yeah, and then like the problem with the car businesses and you hear it all the time. A lot of scumbags. Mm -hmm.